when I am weaker than you, I ask you for freedom, because that is according to your principles. When I am stronger than you, I take away your freedom, because that is according to my principles. Frank Herbert, The Children of Doom, 1976. Academic Agent recently put out a rather interesting video titled Moral Particularism versus Universalism, which you can find in the description of this video. In it, Academic Agent poses a bit of a problem for the modern political right. He makes reference to many examples of moral particularism found in various cultures across time and paraphrases their texts. The result is a litany of examples of people who viewed the world to a certain extent in a rules for thee, not for me fashion. In such a world, members of the in-group are entitled to certain rights and privileges while also being held to account by the moral law of their given culture. Meanwhile, outsiders, members of the out-group, are explicitly viewed to be lesser than and not entitled to the same rights, protections, nor obligations as the in-group. In the past, this distinction was explicit and open. Now, however, we are dealing with a similar phenomenon, but presented entirely dishonestly by the political left in the name of equality and equal rights. One has but to open their eyes and look around to see this moral particularism play out over and over across the political landscape. The political left will howl of white supremacy, institutional racism, and bleat for reparations from whites while downplaying, recasting, or ignoring the more violent elements within their coalition. Two contemporary examples of this are the violent antics of Antifa and the interracial hostilities within the broad leftist coalition. Antifa's violence and hooliganism, particularly during the Trump presidency, is constantly downplayed or recast as crusades fighting against the far right. We're also told people of color stand in solidarity against white supremacy, but over the past year, there's been a big issue with black Americans disproportionately targeting Asians in random racialized acts of violence. These incidents are ignored or recast as the inevitable outcome of a white supremacist capitalist patriarchal system which victimizes minorities. Blacks can't be morally accountable for their actions to the same degree whites are because their social situation is the product of a white society imposing itself upon them. What makes this moral particularism at play with the left different from the past is it is doing so in the name of universal rights, principally equality. In the past, moral particularism was explicit and anti-egalitarian for any number of reasons. Our people are chosen by God. They are heretics. Or they are simply born unclean. Because of this, they are lower than we and should be held to a different standard. These type of justifications for moral particularism are not employed today, leastways not openly in our progressive society. Since innate group differences and cultural distinctions necessitating different outcomes are cast aside without any inspection, and humanity is a tabula rasa, any discrepancy has to be the result of unjust social structures. While striving to achieve their impossible and deleterious goals for humanity, the forces of progress and globalism are, practically speaking, engaging in constant moral particularism, regardless of how they frame it. Now, you can call these tactics disgusting or dishonest, but they do make some sense, but not because they are real or morally coherent. This leftist tactic makes sense because their goal is to achieve power, and once there, they'll be able to change the order of things and bring about a new aeon of equality and harmony in the absence of whiteness, or so they say. It is a pure, distilled, unconstrained vision of the future. With this approach, they weaponize the morality of the wider society against its inhabitants. If you're not a bigot, then open the borders. You don't want a gay child? That's homophobia. If you don't advocate reparations, you want to perpetuate structural inequalities in a society built on the backs of black and brown people. And so on and on. A sizable chunk of the American public has already been thoroughly indoctrinated in the moral assumptions of progress, namely that equality is a good and should be a goal in and of itself, 
and all differences between people are the result of social pressure. Such indoctrinees will bend against their own interests to yield ground to the left who plays on the universalist moral sentiment of their targets while they accrue ever more power. Some critics of progressivism of a more will-to-power mindset will see what the left is doing and say, yes, this is what we need to do to win. Moral universalism is an albatross around our necks, keeping us from building a strong, healthy society with healthy in-group preference. The problem with rejecting universalism whole hog, however, is that it inevitably leads to amoralism and nihilism. If there is no law above our laws, or no telos to creation, then man has become his own god. Instead of submitting to the Lord and his law, we are either elevating our moral law above the Lord's or rejecting his entirely. If we are to not reject God's universal law, then what is the answer to the asymmetric progressive attack from a traditional perspective? Do we need to come up with our own solutions to this, or can we look to history and Christian tradition to answer this for us? Fortunately, as the word says, there is nothing new under the sun, and we can look to both scripture and the history of Christendom as our guide to create a robust moral order which reconciles both universalism and particularism rooted in Christ. In the Old Testament scriptures, which the Christian church cannot deny, there is explicit healthy ethnocentrism. The Jews are chosen by God to be a vessel from which mankind's salvation and the death of death is to be born the Lord Jesus Christ, our King and God. The Jews are given particular laws by the Lord which apply to them for the purposes of their preservation and preparation for the Messiah. They are promised Palestine and given the land as a nation. They are also divinely chastised at various times as a nation. Israel fulfills all three aspects of Roger Scruton's criteria for nationhood. They have a place, Israel, a creed, faith in the true God and the laws of Moses, and are also bounded to the covenant and descended from Abraham through blood. They also have certain laws and privileges which apply to themselves alone. However, despite some of the moral particularity of the Jews, the surrounding Gentile kingdoms are subject to God's universal moral law as well, and routinely judged for their wickedness both by the Jews and the Lord God himself. Nevertheless, the Lord does work among them in his own way. An example of this is when God sent Jonah out to the Gentiles of Nineveh to call the people there to repentance. The Gentiles are also used by the Lord to periodically chastise the children of Israel in their wickedness as a way to call them to repentance, like when they became captives in Babylon. Following the ministry of Christ, the church became the new Israel. The law isn't done away with during the coming of the Messiah, but rather fulfilled, and neither are the distinctions between the nations erased. In the New Testament, we see that the different nations are present in the last day, clearly indicating that the particular culture and ethnic distinctions between peoples are not erased and preserved right up until the final judgment. While there is unity in Christ, this absolutely does not mean that we are to become homogenized and bereft of the particular qualities of our people group. Not only is the scripture clear on this, but so too is the history of Christendom as well. In Byzantium, there were a great many people within the bounds of the empire. Greeks, Slavs, Egyptians, Turkic people, North Africans, and Judeans. Within the Christian Imperium, they maintained their own customs, lived in their own lands unless pushed out by invaders, and possessed their own cultural particularities, but they were unified through the church and fealty to the Christian emperor. In more modern times, the Empire of Austria ruled a primarily Catholic empire under the Habsburg dynasty, with loyal subjects of varied ethnicity. Loyal members of the empire weren't just Austrian Germans, but also Czechs, Croats, and others. What held these distinct peoples loyal to the throne? They were allowed to live in their own lands, hold to their own customs, largely maintain local leadership, held predominantly the same faith, and swore fealty to the crown. There was the lordship of the Christian emperor, who may himself belong to a different people group, but the emperor wouldn't flood your area with heathen outsiders and try to destroy your local customs and undermine your faith. The emperor protects. The same was also true of smaller Christian kingdoms as well. So what can we draw from these historical and scriptural examples, and how can we apply them today? The message of the gospel is meant for everybody, and it should be the hope of all Christians for every need to bow and every tongue to confess. God's law applies to us all, and thus the dominion of the Lord's law is universal, both among the faithful and the heathen. However, the church has never advocated the deracination of person from culture and heritage. 
The Lord made the nations, each of its own character, as he made the many varied creatures of the earth. Therefore, to seek to destroy the nations and what makes them differentiated, say through mass immigration, is to raise a hand against what the Lord himself has created. It's true that progressive and globalist subversives will seek to employ a false moral universalism to do evil and undermine the nations and God's church. But did not Satan himself quote scripture when tempting Christ in the wilderness? This playing upon the faiths, values, and morals of others for evil purposes is nothing new, including misrepresentations of the universal law and truth of God found in the scriptures and holy tradition. The Bible itself warns us this would happen. The enemies of God are numerous, and while the Lord is merciful, the Lord is also a righteous judge, and authority of the sword is given by the Lord for the punishment of evildoers and preservation of the righteous and theirs. At the end of his video, Academic Agent asks a number of questions. First being, are you a moral universalist or a particularist? The traditional Christian position, and mine as well, is and has been that God's law and ethics are universal. Here I make a distinction between ethics and morals. In my understanding, morals are the particular manifestation of ethics. These morals can manifest themselves in variation in different societies at different times while being valid. For example, if one committed murder in Inuit society, he would likely be banished. Likewise, if someone committed the same crime in Constantinople, he'd be put to death. Both are moral manifestations in response to God's law, thou shalt not kill. They are rooted in ethics, which necessarily have a divine source and are universal. Social morals that do not directly contradict God's law are particular and permitted to be so. So my answer to academic agent's question of whether I'm a moral universalist or particularist is both, essentially. I'm an ethical universalist and moral particularist insofar as the morals support and reinforce the ethical law, which is rooted in the Lord. Academic agent also asks, on what basis could someone holding universalist values object to the open society as envisioned by somebody like Karl Popper? The answer to this is rather simple in my worldview. Heathenry, anti-theism, and all manner of grave sins are explicitly against the laws of God. Thus, to endorse these or elevate false faiths in the name of pluralism to a level equal to that of the true faith cannot be tolerated, for to do so would be to raise demons and false gods alongside the Most High. The open society is also an attack on ethnos, which, as mentioned before, is an attack on the people groups that the Lord has made. In the Christian perspective, the basis of the friend-enemy distinction is whether or not one is a servant of the Lord or his enemy. And as enemies can take many forms, so too can friends. Friends might be part of the same ethnos, be a foreign neighboring ally, or part of the same faith. In the past, friend groups would naturally arise through ethnogenesis, trade relations, alliances, and missionary work. In the modern West, however, deracinated and secularized as we are, it is perhaps the challenge of our modern age to form bonds of faith, place, and blood. The Christian solution to this may not jive with some of the skeptics, pagans, or will-to-power types who might be listening to this. Nevertheless, I strongly believe that the first step to effective change begins with comprehending God's will for man, as traditionally understood by the church, and submitting to it. And only when we have prepared ourselves to be such will we be made tools of providence to bring about his will. This has been Mr. Patriarch. Thanks for watching and making it all the way to the end. If you've enjoyed this, one of the best things you can do to help grow the channel is share it. Also, if you want to support the show directly, please consider becoming a patron on Subscribestar. Every little bit helps. Special thanks to my backers, Count Elmsley, NRX Shrapnel, and Burnham's Ghost the first supporters on Subscribestar at any level who help this channel reach its first goal will have a goodie coming their way in the form of their own bit of content. I'm of course grateful for any support you're willing to give and I look forward to seeing you all again soon. Patriarch out.